I am going. Great. All right. Well, again, thank you all and welcome for uh, welcome to our regional meeting for the Cape and Islands. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so you all can view our presentation. All right, so as I said, my name is Dana LeWinter and I am the Director of Municipal Engagement here at CHAPA. Um, CHAPA is the um, statewide affordable housing organization. We encourage the production and preservation of homes that are affordable to households with low and moderate incomes and to foster diverse and sustainable neighborhoods through planning and community development. And for more than 50 years, we have advocated for opportunity at the local, state, and federal levels. We've worked to expand access to housing through our coordination of the Massachusetts Homeownership Collaborative, monitoring thousands of affordable homes across the state and administering mass access. And we developed the affordable housing field through trainings and forums, our Young Professionals Network, and our mentorship program that we run um, in collaboration with the Mel King Institute. We at CHAPA bring together a broad group of stakeholders because we believe that together we can build a better future for everyone in the Commonwealth. And this is something we've always done in Massachusetts, kind of shaping the future that we want for ourselves. But the affordable housing challenges facing our state right now put us at risk of losing the very things that make Massachusetts so great. And the urgency of the COVID pandemic and the racial injustices just demand that we rethink how we, uh, how we do this work and who we wanna be as a commonwealth. Um, understanding that the decisions we make now will really determine our future and done well, we can ensure that every person can have an affordable home in the community of their choice. There are a lot of big challenges ahead, many of which we will talk about today, but we wanna hear from you because we know that our goals are achievable. We can make it so that every person in Massachusetts has the ability to live in safe, healthy, and affordable homes in the communities that they choose. So I'm really excited about our agenda today. Um, I do wanna thank our annual regional meeting sponsor, Bank of America, um, for making these meetings possible. And I also wanna thank our local participating co-hosts, the Community Development Partnership, Housing Assistance Corporation and Housing Nantucket, who you will hear from um, the challenges and opportunities that they see for your region in just a minute. Um, I've already told you who CHAPA is, but just to give you a sense of our agenda, we're gonna hear from our policy team about our state and federal updates and priorities. We'll also hear about our fair housing efforts um, and our municipal engagement initiative. And then we'll hear our regional updates from our partner organizations. And we wanna hear from you. You all know your communities better than we do or than anyone else. Uh, so we really wanna make sure you share your challenges, strategies, and concerns so that we can all learn as we go along. So with that, I am going to hand it over to uh, my colleagues on the policy team, Abhi. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, this is Abhi Kurve. Uh, I am the policy associate and I work with our policy team for uh, advancing our agenda on affordable housing and uh, we do a lot of coalition building and advocacy at the state house. So just to give an overview of um, what all has been going on, and there's a lot uh, on the legislative side, as well as the budget side um, of this year. So just to recap and give a context of what happened last year, one of the very critical things that um, passed through the economic development bill was housing reforms, uh, housing choice uh, reforms that the governor had proposed and this is really significant as it provides a great tool for many communities that do want to build more and it just removes certain barriers of zoning that were existing and that were stopping many developments from going forward that had affordable housing so um, next slide so just to give an overview uh, housing choice uh, is a change to the state's zoning law chapter 40a uh, and it's it's sort of coming together of uh, transportation, housing, and keeping keeping in mind all of those factors as we uh, you know put in place these tools that allow for smart growth zoning that allows for more housing. This change applies to all cities and towns except Boston. It, the law is currently in effect, and um, all the communities that uh, do not comply will will you know do not comply will be 
uh, falling short of not getting um, certain grants. I will talk about that later. And one of the biggest changes that this law does is provide certain zoning ordinances by laws can be enacted by simple majority vote. It was super majority. And we saw many uh, developments not go ahead because they simply fell short with a few votes. And so this will basically change that and get, get it to a simple majority instead of a two third. And we are hoping that that will allow many more developments to go forward. Next slide. So uh, the law does three basic things. It uh, allows the certain zoning, zoning ordinances to pass by a simple majority, as I said. It adds a multifamily zoning requirement for MBTA municipalities, uh, not the Cape and all, like this is not applied to many of the Cape uh, communities, but it also allows some changes to streamlining, permitting and uh, a butter appeals reforms, which were also one of the major barriers that dragged down developments for many, many years and making them costlier. Uh, the DHCD is it's supposed to issue guidance for many of the things that are in this reform in terms of what accounts as a you know reasonable size and like you know those things so we we'll talk about that more but there is more to be uh, understood as the DHCD issues their guidance and they are in process of getting some input and issuing that in in a couple of months from now or weeks from now uh so the qualifying zoning changes that can be passed by a by simple majority uh, allows for certain kinds of housing by right, multifamily housing, mixed use and eligible location. Um, there are specific definitions of what counts as an eligible location, but for more guidance, we will look to DHCD uh, and their guidance coming out. Uh, it allows for uh, ADUs um, by right, whether within a home or a detached structure on the same lot. Uh, some open space res residential development and a whole list more. I'll make sure to share a, a link that has a whole list of things that, you know, that basically can be passed by right. But it also allows for certain kinds of housing development by special permits. Um, I have listed all these things here. I'm going to quickly run through that. But for more details, please uh, check out the links that we will be posting because they have a lot more information. Moving forward, I'm going to quickly skim through the uh, multifamily uh, requirement because that's not, I'm guessing many of you guys are not from communities that this applies to, but if you are, um, that was a great uh, next slide thing. That was a new thing that was added to the state's zoning act and it requires at least one zoning district of reasonable size in which multifamily housing is permitted by right. So this basically applies to communities that have MBTA access and we can ensure that there is development around that MBTA. So I'll just skim through that. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, this is just a map of which communities it applies to. And there are so if you want more information, please do check out these resources. Uh, as I said, there is a lot more that we are awaiting through the guidance, but our hope is that as we as this uh, this tool sort of becomes more accessible to communities, and it already is in effect, uh, although the three grants uh, that will not be available if you're not compliant are Housing Choice Initiative, Local Capital Projects Fund, and Mass Works Infrastructure Development Program. So these that will, even if uh, you're not compliant, you can still uh, have access to these grants up till 2022. Beyond that, you have to be compliant. Um, so that is that is a great that is a great change that we have seen that happen in zoning in Massachusetts. And this was very much uh, something that we have been pushing for, and we hope to build over as we look to our for future legislative priorities. So just jumping onto our uh, upcoming legislative priorities for this session, we have a lot going on on many. Uh, many aspects, uh, but building on this law, we have, um, next slide, team. we have, um, oh, I'll do the budget, I guess. Uh, we have a lot of priorities that I'll talk about, but also something that is ongoing right now is the state budget process. Uh, with the pandemic, there was a fear that we will, you know, the, the budget revenues will be down, but in fact, they have gone up and the state right now has a more money uh, to spend than they have had in many, many years. So we have seen increases in many of the housing programs. We are really happy that uh, the conference budget that came out had an increased funding for many of the housing programs and almost all of our budget requests were, uh, were included in that conference budget. Uh, we, we are still advocating for better language for MRVP. <clears throat> 
and RAF to make sure that RAF and home base are both accessible to people um, beyond the end of state of emergency. So we, those changes are included and we are really happy to see that. And so jumping to our legislative priorities, um, as I said before, we are building on what was achieved in the, in the last session. Uh, we are having, a, we are advocating for a housing production bill that builds on those housing choice reforms and goes a little further to, to set a statewide affordable housing goal. We have a housing goal, but we need an affordable housing goal uh, requiring multifamily uh, around public transportation across all of Massachusetts to be by right and allowing um, ADUs by right across the state. Uh, also strengthening some of our housing programs uh, that are that are there in our state like MRVP, Mass Rental Voucher Program, make it more permanent and establish it in statute. Right now it is only established through the budget. And so it is, um, it, it can be changed uh, or it is vulnerable to change in every budget cycle. So we just wanna make it more permanent. Uh, right to counsel to help address the eviction crisis. We know that there is a huge imbalance in uh, legal representation for residents versus property owners. So just making sure um, both property owners as well as uh, tenants who are uh, who who own uh, who are from a lower income uh, are able to have legal representation. So that is what this bill does, and those are some things that we will be pushing for uh, in this session. <clears throat> We have a whole host of other things. We have a whole host of uh, fair housing priorities that I know Whitney is gonna be talking about, but we are also trying to ensure that our public housing is strengthened by creating more resources for public housing redevelopment uh, and also creating additional revenue for affordable housing um, by, incre by increasing the deeds excise for property sales. So this is just some of our uh, priorities, but as you see, we are overall our hope is that we address the affordable housing supply side of things and make sure that we take, uh, we make full use of this opportunity and this revenue that we have uh, through state and federal resources and make it, you know, make it so that we are able to supply more housing to meet the needs of um, Commonwealth's residents. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass on to, um, oh, okay. Uh, also, just a quick note, we had a, a huge change in the housing uh, leadership in the State House. We have two new chairs uh, after uh, Representative Honan, Honan moved on. We have uh, Representative Arciero and Senator Keenan on the Housing Committee. Just a quick note, they are really responsive and we are excited to be working with them. It's always an opportunity to connect and push forward our agenda more when there are new chairs. At the same time, recognizing that Rep. Honan was a, a, a legend in terms of pushing housing reforms. And with that, I'll pass it on to Ryan, who will speak more about the federal relief funds, which is a hot topic right now. I would also say that the budget, pro just one last plug, is that the, bu the budget process in the is the budget is at the governor's desk and he has uh, 10 days, which is up till July 19th to sign it. And so uh, we hope and we're advocating that he signs uh, the increased amounts and there are not too many changes in the budget. So that's our hope and we are hopeful that he'll sign it soon. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you to be uh, for that very comprehensive overview of the state budget priorities, as well as some of our legislative priorities. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the federal relief funds that are coming in um, from the American Rescue Plan Act specifically. Uh, so as you may all know, back in March, President Biden signed the uh, Ar uh, American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, uh, which allocated billions of dollars to Massachusetts, including a number of resources that can and should be used for housing. Uh, so you'll see up here on the first slide are the first bucket of funding, which is the fiscal, fiscal recovery funds. Uh, so Massachusetts is eligible to receive up to um, $5.3 billion in fiscal recovery funds, while cities and towns, as well as counties, can receive up to $3.4 billion directly. Uh, these funds can be used to support everything from public health, lost revenue, infrastructure, and of course, housing. Uh, you may have seen that the governor came out with a plan for these funds, which includes around $1 billion for housing, uh, $500 million for home ownership, and $500 million for rental housing production. Uh, so some of your cities and towns uh, and maybe even the counties will receive direct fiscal recovery funds. Uh, and you'll see this on the next slide um, that cities and counties uh, receive are receiving millions of dollars. 
and it will be up to you as local advocates to work with your uh, local governments to create a process for allocating some of these funds. Uh, so as you'll see up on the slide, uh, Barnstable is receiving around $7.5 million directly. Yarmouth is receiving around $3 million directly. And you'll see uh, Barnstable County as a whole is receiving around $41 million. So if you do not see your city or town up here, uh, then you may be considered a non-entitlement community. Uh, and you will see that this state through potentially DACD uh, will then distribute around $385 million uh, to each of your cities and towns based on me. Uh, so in terms of like the eligible uses for fiscal recovery funds, uh, you can advocate for your city or town to use it for rent, mortgage or utility assistance, uh, counseling or legal aid uh, to prevent any evictions that may be coming up, uh, and affordable housing development, which is a uh, key, especially in terms of trying to meet the housing crisis that we're currently facing, and as well as supportive services to address homelessness and uh, you know to create more supportive housing uh, for that population. So throughout this slide deck, I've included the US Treasury guidance for all of the federal funds that I'll be talking about today uh, so that you can see what types of these funds can be used towards housing and uh, what specific programs that they can actually fund. Uh, I would recommend that each of you review each of these different links and Treasury guidance uh, pretty extensively as you work with your local governments to allocate some of this funding for housing. Uh, so up on the slide, you'll also see a few other federal programs that have been funded through ARPA. Uh, the first one is the emergency, emergency housing vouchers. Uh, so these work exactly like Section 8 or uh, housing choice vouchers, and they're directly targeted uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness or domestic violence or any type of housing instability. And specifically, DHCD is receiving 917 emergency vouchers. So if you know anybody who uh, needs housing or a voucher uh, and is experiencing either uh, homelessness or domestic violence or some type of housing instability, I would definitely reach out to DHCD and see if uh, you can get that family or that person an emergency housing voucher. Uh, and another program that we all are familiar with is the HOME program. Uh, there was $125 million that was given to HOME. Uh, and these funds can be used to create housing and provide supportive services for those who are experiencing or are at risk of experiencing homelessness. So uh, you'll see here that Barnstable County will receive a little over $1.5 million directly. And then uh, anybody uh, who fits outside of that are probably in the non-entitlement community group. And uh, for home, there's around $36 million that is going that will be going to non-entitlement communities. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the homeowners uh, homeowners assistance fund, uh, which will help to pay for uh, mortgages and utility costs, and really to try to help to prevent any type of foreclosures. And there's around 178.5 million dollars that's going to this homeownership fund. And then on the last slide, uh, you'll see that we have information about the emergency rental assistance, which was the biggest tranche of funding that we've received. Uh, there's around $819 million that is being put through the state rental assistance programs, such as RAP, uh, ERAP, and SHIRA. Uh, but Barstable County is also receiving around $5 million directly for emergency rental assistance. Um, so if you know anybody who needs uh, any type of assistance uh, while facing like an eviction, such as emergency rental assistance, access to a lawyer, uh, you'll see on the next slide that there's actually a link to the state resource page uh, that has all the information and guidance for how housing agencies should uh, put out some of these services, but also how uh, individuals and families can sign up for some of these as well. Uh, and then finally, on the last slide, uh, we would just recommend that you as advocates contact your state legislators uh, to support CHAPA's policy priorities, uh, the ones that Aviv was talking about for the state budget, as well as the legislate, uh, this legislative session. Uh, but we'll also be coming out with priorities for the federal ARPA funds. Uh, and there's actually going to be a hearing um, sometime next week. Uh, we're not sure right now if it's going to be open to the public, but uh, I think that the state legislature and the governor will be talking a little 
little bit about uh, some of their plans for the federal ARPA funds. And uh, we'll make sure to put out our priority list so that you can also contact some of your local municipal offices and decision makers to make sure that they're putting some of that uh, towards housing. And then finally, uh, we have a number of chapter committees which you can join into and uh, provide some of your local insight from the Cape and Islands on how we should uh, create more policies or uh, what we should prioritize kind of moving forward. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it on to my colleague Whitney who can talk a little bit about fair housing. And Ryan, just before you go, there's a couple of questions in the chat for you. Um, <laughs> First, how long does the emergency housing vouchers that you were speaking of last? Those are short term or are they long term? Yeah, so um, they, they do have a sunset date, uh, which is 2030. Uh, we try to push it into perpetuity, but uh, based on the National um, Low Income Housing Coalition, they were able to get that as the 2030 uh, end date. Um, so, you know, there'll still be efforts to try to make those a little bit more permanent, but for now, uh, they have that 2030 end date. Okay, and then it looks like you referred to a number 819, was it million or billion? Kyle, I'm not sure um, which- oh, You know what? I'm just noticing that right now. And that was a typo on my end, I apologize. Okay. Uh, but for uh, the emergency rental assistance is $819 million, uh, which is still like a huge pot of money. And I know we're throwing millions of billions out there, <laughs> which can seem a little bit like monopoly money, but uh, it is a, still a huge resource for us uh, at the state level. And I'll make sure to change that typo. On, on <laughs> if you say line. it enough, Ryan, maybe it'll <laughs> get true. And so we'll just <laughs> <Exactly>. saying it. <laughs> All right, thank you. And now we'll um, move on to Whitney. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, there is much to do and much to be excited about. I um, was happy to see in the chat all the things that folks are eager and excited about in the housing world. And I'm excited to share uh, the fair housing initiatives here at CHAPA. Um, my name is Whitney Demetrius. I am the Fair Housing um, Engagement Director under the Municipal Engagement Initiative Program. And while CHAPA has always placed uh, fair housing at the center of all of our work, we're also intentionally doing that um, in many ways, which I'll share uh, towards the, the end of my short presentation. But also we are working with our partners with you all in the work that you're doing. And we're interested in really doing some more mapping and some more coordinated efforts around what you're doing in the fair housing world. Um, but I wanna set sort of the landscape in terms of the work, much like Ryan did, talking about a, sort of federally what's happening in the world of fair housing. So certainly I'd be remiss to not mention the Biden administration sort of efforts building back better in fair housing really. And I'll highlight sort of three things, what the redressing of discriminatory housing practices, um, some exciting pieces around sex discrimination and certainly affirmatively furthering fair housing. So the next slide I just wanted to share and back in January, which many of us have probably seen uh, the memo on redressing our nation's federal government's history of discriminatory housing practices and policies was issued by the Biden administration, which really looked to acknowledge the historical patterns of segregation, and then also to examine sort of what happened in the former administration and what sort of steps were necessary to conform um, and make requirements um, be in line with the Fair Housing Act. Um, so that sort of redressing uh, of things was um, certainly a welcomed um, change. As, uh, in addition, back in February, a uh, HUD memo was issued around sex discrimination. Um, as many of us know, sex is a protected class federally, but um, it would include male and female. It went further here in this memo to also include um, sexual orientation and gender identity. This is really, really huge. Certainly we have sexual orientation as a protected status in Massachusetts, um, but there are many implications, right, where it's now covered under federal law and cases can be filed at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So this is a really great expansion on uh, the definition of sex discrimination as a protected status under the Fair Housing Act. 
Um, so excited to, to really be sharing that. And then lastly, uh, restoring the affirmatively furthering for housing definitions and certifications. There's been sort of a restoring of the 2015 affirmatively furthering for housing rule that was rescinded during our former um, administration. The interim final rule uh, sort of comment period recently ended earlier this week and uh, they have extended um, actually rather the effective date for the uh, for the final version will be July uh, end of July July 31st of this year so that certainly again is is exciting um, because I think many of the comments that are coming in and the feedback they'll be getting is to refine it and how it might look better so interested to see the final version there uh, and so at CHAPA, we have our fair housing legislative agenda and priorities that have come together. So I have the pleasure actually of being able to share the great work that our policy team, Abi, Eric, Ryan have really put together. So I don't take much credit for this other than uh, really being able to give my insight, but it's my pleasure to really share the priorities we've been able to um, to put together around uh, exclusionary zoning, which we've been working on for some time, uh, and then also disparate impact, and lastly, an affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, law. And so these sort of bills together will really work to prohibit discrimination against affordable housing. It will prevent intentional and unintentional housing discrimination by creating this disparate impact standard. And then lastly, the affirmatively furthering will create a state level duty to affirmatively further fair housing. And so we invite you all to dive into these pieces of legislation and certainly advocate and uh, help us to get these things right. We help I invite you also to join our fair housing committee and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in addition to sort of having um, a mindset of what's happening federally, as well as the state in terms of the bills we put together, who also are interested in local level initiatives that you all are working on, right? So of course, across the Commonwealth, there are fair housing committees and commissions and human rights commissions and diversity and equity and inclusion officers, right? Um, that really work on these key things that are so important on the local level around education and outreach, around providing assistance for people who experience discrimination, around local and state policy advocacy to promote open and welcoming communities, right? All of these things that are really so, so very essential. So um, uh, we invite you as well, if you are interested in, and thank you, Lily, my colleague, who in the chat will share um, sort of how you get started. If you don't have a fair housing committee or commission, you're interested about how to start one, we'll share resources there. And certainly if you're interested in hearing more about fair housing and learning more about fair housing, we invite you to check out our housing toolbox in the fair housing sort of section there to uh, to find out more. We certainly want to be a resource to you all as well. And lastly, I shared that we have revitalized our fair housing committee at CHAPA. Uh, this group that I'm helping to, to sort of lead the effort in meets periodically. It's a diverse group of stakeholders. So you may not work exclusively on fair housing, but you have an interest and a passion we want you as part of that, right? Um, so we're working to uh, have representation across the state and uh, to work on legislation, like uh, the bills I mentioned, to coordinate our efforts together, to educate ourselves. And uh, so we'll share the link for, for folks who are interested in joining that effort. Um, so there is much you can do, right? So as Ryan and Abby did, I'm going to charge you on what you might be able to do. You can certainly join uh, local efforts. You can revitalize uh, your uh, fair housing committees. You can establish a fair housing committee or commission. And also like, thinking about how do you expand it? Right? How, what work can further be done? So joining those efforts. Uh, certainly contacting your municipal officials and decision makers and state legislators to support the bills. And certainly we invite you to join our Fair Housing Committee. Uh, and so all the links we shared there and certainly reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and again, I work in the Municipal Engagement Initiative. So I've, we're, we're constantly working on the local level on these various things. And I've been having the pleasure of doing many of these conversations locally in the Cape. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to uh, Dana who will talk a little bit more about what the Municipal Engagement Initiative is and look forward to the questions and the engagement uh, 
during our discussion portion. Thank you, Whitney. All right, so as uh, you, as I told you before, I'm Dana LeWinter from our Municipal Engagement Initiative. Um, and I wanted to give you just a little bit of background on what we are and what we do. And some of you are working with us currently or are going to be working with us, which has been such a pleasure to get to know the Cape communities and island communities better. Um, but our work is really built off of this premise uh, that we all knew and saw uh, in our day-to-day -day work, but was highlighted very clearly and, and eloquently through a study that was um, done by some re researchers at BU, Catherine Einstein, David Glick, and Maxwell Palmer uh, called the Neighborhood Defenders. They were looking at participatory politics and the housing crisis. They essentially went through uh, meeting minutes from a, a slew of meetings across the greater Boston region and they compared commenters at public meetings regarding housing with voters in those same communities. And what they found was that commenters were disproportionately white, male, older, and, and more likely to be homeowners um, than the voters in the community. And these trends really persisted across all of the cities and towns that they looked at. Um, and what happened was people who spoke up were more likely to be speaking in opposition to new housing production, in opposition to affordable housing, in opposition to policies and zoning that would create more housing opportunity. And by doing that, we end up with an inadequate supply of housing in, in really desirable neighborhoods. Um, and in those advantaged neighborhoods, it pushes development into less affluent communities. This can lead to gentrification, displacement. It's, it's really what we're all seeing on the ground, um, but definitely check out their, their website, housingpolitics.com to read more about it. Um, and we also, you know, you all drive around your communities, you see these signs everywhere you go, you know, stop the monster, stop the whopper, no housing here, this isn't right for our community. Um, we, we see these signs everywhere in all the, the communities that we go to. Um, and we felt like we need to change the narrative from what we don't want in our communities to what do we want? How do we want to move forward and create the kind of communities that we know we can achieve? So that when we go around our communities now, we'd like to see signs like this. Knowing that community support can make or break housing development at the local level, but many communities have no strategy or coalition to build that local support, that's where our municipal engagement initiative comes in to create that, that strategy, create that coalition, and really change the, the narrative and the framework that we're working with. So we do that by supporting the efforts of the communities that we're in to build this welcoming culture towards housing, particularly affordable housing. We bolster the efforts at the local level, um, partner with the, the groups that are already doing this work and expand the number of people who are supporting housing production and affordability in each community. Um, and we do this by kind of going outside of the usual suspects, going beyond who you would typically have in your meeting. So if we understand from the BU report that the people who generally show up to meetings are opposed to housing uh, and they're outnumbering the people who are in support of it, we need to build those numbers in a different way than we have been before. So what we do is we, tr we create coalitions, really broad-based stakeholder groups. We start with a core of folks, who we see as our, our key allies in a community. These are maybe people who are already engaged in the city or town um, doing housing work. And then we work with them to identify partners and um, stakeholders that might be a little bit outside of who you would typically think of. Um, but we very much see housing as core and key to so much of what makes communities thriving and successful. And so we see the Chamber of Commerce, the League of Women Voters, the environmental groups, the transit groups, the all of the social service providers, food, food access groups, um, Black Lives Matters groups, all of those folks, we want to be in the room talking about housing because we see it as so critical to, to the conversations we're having. And then we go forward with those conversations. We do a data dive and we do a launch event or meeting to really get people on the same page having these, these critical conversations. There's process, there's growth, there's action, but in every one of our communities, we have seen positive actions towards creating more housing and more affordability. And that's really what we want to see. We do have a toolkit um, on our website 
that you can take, take a look at. It has sample agendas for meetings and stakeholder lists and coalition building activities. Um, so definitely take a look at that. Um, and, and of course, reach out to us if you're interested in getting involved in it. Um, this all feels like a lot. So I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas of where you might be able to start if you're not ready to build a coalition at the local level. Um, first, I would encourage you to dig into your local housing data. We always rely on our partners at MHP. Their data town tool is really important. You can look at uh, up-to-date information on your community and also compare to other communities to see where you might have some synergies or ideas that you could uh, borrow from other, other places. We encourage you to meet with your local planners and elected officials to better understand what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what the local climate is in housing. You have to show up to public meetings. This is the most important one because you have to speak up for more housing and more affordability. We know that the people who don't want housing and don't want more affordable housing in their community are very motivated. They will continue to show up and, and most importantly is being at those meetings. Um, to, to make sure that your voice is heard. You can push back against myths and exclusionary language and concerns that you hear. So let's say you're at a planning meeting and someone says, you know, we want this, but it can't possibly be a uh, family size housing because we just can't support any more students in our school. Well, look at the data. Maybe your school system has actually seen a decrease in enrollment over the last few years. That may not actually play out. Or maybe they're saying things like, well, we want affordable housing, but not that kind of affordable housing. Well, dig deeper, push, push a little further back at these kinds of exclusionary comments because that's how we make, we make progress in this way. There's always a need for more educational forums in your community. A lot of your communities have done this already, but we would be happy to partner with you on that or, or point you in the direction of successful education forums because so many people just don't understand both the need for housing in their communities and what the potential strategies are that they could achieve. And then really listening to people with the deepest affordability concerns in your community is, is so critical. Um, making sure that the voices of people who will use the housing that you're creating are elevated, are supported, are heard, and are respected. Um, I think that a couple of things I want to leave you with before we go to our regional uh, partner updates are some ways to get engaged with our municipal engagement initiative. So um, Lily has um, office hours uh, weekly that you can sign up for. So if you just want to learn a little bit about more about the municipal engagement initiative or talk to her about the challenges that you're facing, um, you can sign up for those um, through her Calendly link. We also do affordable housing 101 sessions. Um, this is really great for people who are newer to affordable housing and coalition building. Uh, we go over kind of the alphabet soup of all of the terms that you hear and the different really basic idea of what all of the strategies are that you might encounter in affordable housing. Um, those meetings are monthly and they are also always translated into Spanish. So please share widely with your network. You don't have to be in one of our coalitions to join. And then lastly, we have a, a group that we called our Making the Case Working Group. This is where we, it's essentially a peer to peer. Yes, thank you, Lily. The next one is this coming Tuesday. So still time to sign up. Um, and our Making the Case calls are really this peer to peer working group where people from different coalitions throughout the state come together, share their strategies, share their challenges. We use, um, we learn from a woman named Dr. Tiffany Manuel who wrote a strategic case making book and helps us to make our case. How do we convince and uh, bring more people to the table to do this work? Um, we are, are taking a break in August. Uh, our next one will be in September, but that that um, group meets generally meets monthly. Um, so please, uh, we'd love to have you join us for any of those meetings. Um, and so now we're going to turn it over to some regional updates from our partner organizations. I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quickly so I can see all of you and can also see um, all of our partners. So um, like I said, thank you so much to our regional partners who have been able to join us here today. I think we'll start with, uh, because I see Jay is already unmuted, he's ready to go, um, Jay Coburn from the Community Development Partnership. So Jay, why don't you go ahead and give us some information about uh, what you have been seeing. Sure. Thanks, Dana, and thanks to uh, you and your colleagues at uh, Chapa for uh, organizing this meeting and uh, all of this really important uh, information to help our communities. 
So for those of you who aren't uh, uh, familiar with the CDP, we're a nonprofit community development corporation and we serve the eight lower and outer Cape towns from Provincetown to Brewster and Harwich. We offer an array of programs to create opportunities for people to live, work and thrive on the lower Cape. Uh, we support small businesses and nurture entrepreneurs through training, technical assistance and access to capital through micro lending. And we house 100 families in our affordable and community rental homes, as well as help low income uh, homeowners repair their homes through a housing rehabilitation uh, loan program and also train uh, first time uh, home buyers. We've got lots of things going uh, on here. I'm pleased to say that we've been awarded a uh, regional grant from the town of Turo to uh, uh, help uh, another 25 low income homeowners in Provincetown, Truro and East Ham with repairs on their home through uh, the community development block grant funded uh, program. Uh, we also are just wrapping up uh, another community development block grant uh, micro enterprise loan program for small business owners. And we're able to provide uh, over 40 businesses in all eight towns with over $400,000 in forgivable uh, loans uh, to help them recover from the economic uh, crisis uh, caused by the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, throughout the pandemic, we've been uh, uh, offering our uh, first time homebuyer classes and reached uh, uh, 60 prospective uh, homeowners. Um, and of course, our work with the Lower Community Housing Partnership has uh, also uh, continued. Um, that program, you know, is a comprehensive community-based strategy to increase housing production on the Lower Cape uh, by training uh, uh, elected and appointed officials through our Lower Cape Housing Institute, by uh, organizing our community uh, through our advocacy uh, program to show up at town meetings and testify at public hearings, and then uh, provides also a public uh, education uh, campaign uh, that shows the true faces of the people in our community who need uh, housing. Uh, over the past year, the Lower Cape Housing Institute adapted to the pandemic and we were meeting uh, monthly with a Lower Cape coronavirus housing response uh, meetings that were held uh, every month uh, between April and November. Uh, those uh, meetings uh, connected housing practitioners and town government and social uh, service agencies. One of the things that came out of these meetings was the formation of a, a working group on uh, uh, emergency uh, rental assistance programs uh, that uh, developed a set of regional guidelines uh, for emergency rental assistance provision and evaluation. Um, we are in the process right now of putting together a lower Cape regional housing funding working group to support all of our community housing preservation committees and our affordable housing trusts uh, in, in a way that they can evaluate and define regional funding requests uh, for housing development. Because we're beginning to see uh, a lot more cross-border, uh, town-border uh, uh, requests as different uh, projects are moving through the development pipeline. Over the past year, uh, we've also been collaborating with uh, Dana and our colleagues at CHAPA uh, municipal engagement uh, team to bring uh, the program to four uh, communities on the Lower Cape in order to support uh, coalition building uh, in the uh, region. And then finally, we launched uh, phase two of our uh, media campaign. Uh, Dana, you've got uh, uh, some ads. You can show us uh, the uh, folks the ads that we uh, produce. The theme of this campaign is called We Can't Afford to Lose uh, the People Who Can't Afford to Live Here. And it includes both a print ad as well as a uh, video uh, a campaign that we've been pushing out on uh, social uh, media to build, build a broader awareness and tell the stories of people in our uh, communities. And then finally, um, uh, I just want to do a quick update on uh, the uh, uh, town meeting uh, successes that we've had uh, uh, it, during this year's town meeting uh, season that really been quite extraordinary. The town of Orleans approved $2.8 million in funding to uh, acquire the five acre Governor Prince Motel site and has spent another uh, $2 million to fund uh, Penrose uh, is a redevelopment of the Cape Cod Five Operations Center into 62 units of, uh, of affordable rental uh, housing. Uh, the towns of Truro, East Ham, and Wellfleet, they all voted to increase their local option 
uh, tax on the rooms tax uh, up to 6%. And we are advocating very strongly with all of our Lower Cape Towns uh, to dedicate the, these additional uh, revenues, which just in the four Outer Cape Towns alone accounted for nearly $4 million, uh, to dedicate those funds to uh, housing uh, trusts and for uh, housing uh, programs. Both Wellfleet and Turo revised their uh, accessory dwelling bylaws to allow units to be created with much less uh, permitting and restrictions. Wellfleet voted to spend $1.9 million on a wastewater treatment facility that will serve not only the school and public uh, safety facilities, but also the 46 units of affordable housing that are currently planned uh, for Lawrence Road. Uh, Chatham and Wellfleet also established new affordable housing uh, 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 trusts. And I'm really proud uh, to say that all eight Lower Cape Towns are uh, working on at least one site uh, for uh, housing development. So over the next year, we're gonna be uh, uh, working um, with our partners at uh, POA on bidding on the Wellfleet uh, project. We're working closely with Massachusetts Housing Partnership and CHAPA to uh, improve the Lower Cape Housing Institute uh, offerings over the next year and cover new topics. We're also supporting the region in identifying and allocating new revenue streams uh, to housing. We're expanding uh, our home ownership education program and we'll continue to uh, work with CHAPA to support a network of housing advocates uh, here on the Lower Cape. So thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. It has been a pleasure working with you guys and, and your communities. And I love that, that campaign. Um, I want every community in Massachusetts and every region in Massachusetts to come up with something that speaks to their, their need as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so next up, we have Shauna Moose from Housing Assistance Corporation. Shauna, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Shauna Moose from Housing Assistance Corporation. I think most of you um, no us, we to our community development corporation, we're also the regional administrate administrator for the state's raft um, rental assistance program. So just to give it, um, everyone an idea of how much money has come through the region <laughs> since the pandemic, it's really been enormous. We've had, we count from March 23rd, 2020, when we started to see a big increase in the rental assistance that came through. Um, through today, we've given out three point, um, $3.5 million. In a typical year, our region usually sees $300,000 um, in raft assistance. So it's really, it's been like 10 times the amount of rental assistance coming through. That helped 745 families. And we have been tracking evictions here. Um, so there's 296 households um, across Barnstable County that are in the summary eviction process right now. So it's not as bad as in some other areas who, have, who are seeing um, a lot more of those eviction numbers. Um, but in addition to sort of doing that emergency assistance program, um, we managed that for the state and the new funds that came through the state. We also managed for a couple of towns. Um, many towns wanted to pitch in and do um, rental assistance programs, which were either administered by CDP or we administered some, some administered them themselves. And it's just been a, um, it's been a very nice collaborative effort in terms of sharing processes, you know, with everybody because um, it can be very encumbering. Um, so much documentation that you have to provide. Um, it's, but it's been really gratifying to see private donors um, and foundations, you know, stepped up to give money to rental assistance, which we've really never seen before. Um, but we saw them coming in with their own individual funds. The home builders did a big fundraising campaign. The realtors did a big fundraising campaign. Um, and so that was really great to see. We obviously are focused like everybody else on increasing inventory. I mean, right now what we're seeing is, um, more people than we've ever seen before without jobs. I mean, with jobs, but no homes. Um, they are living in their cars or they're living in motels, staying with friends, trying to ride out the summer months to see if they can't find something in the fall. But we're really seeing the pinch starting. It was bad before, but with the increase in people coming in and buying homes and you know, we feel like there's an, an maybe 30,000 more, 10% increase in the year round population that's really taken a bite out of our available inventory. So we definitely have people coming into our offices 
every week saying my landlord sold the place and I have nowhere to go and I have a job my husband has a job you, you know they have they have the wherewithal to to buy but there's nothing or or to rent so we're really focused on adding inventory any way we can we have um 128 affordable housing units in our development pipeline right now in a couple of projects. I know there's some people from Brewster here. We're all really excited about Brewster Woods has great momentum. It was decades in the making. Um, I'm hoping that we can use some of this momentum and you know crisis language <laughs> now to get towns to move on these projects a little bit quicker. Um, what's really holding them up is getting the towns to the point where they're issuing the RFPs. I mean, it's still a five-year process to do these larger 30, 50 unit low-income tax credit projects, but it's sitting with the town for 10 years or more <laughs> before the RFP gets issued. And we don't have a lot of land available here on Cape Cod. Most of it's already developed or it's protected. So you know, that's one of the things we're going to be pushing for working with towns and working with advocates in the town is if you've got the land, if it's been designated for affordable housing, issue the RFP, you know, because we have to we have to get these things moving. Um, the other thing that we are working on um, a lot is infill development. I mean, we're still going to have to do the big affordable housing, low income tax credit projects because we need to produce a lot of units. But again, given that we don't have that much land, we need to look at new opportunities for um, redeveloping underutilized commercial properties. You know, we've all driven by those sort of vacant storefronts and they're not coming back, you know, and they're already developed. And so one of the things that Housing Assistance is doing is working with the Association to Preserve Cape Cod and look at some, some mapping of priority areas. Um, what should be remain open space for natural resource protection because we've got a very delicate environment here and we do have water issues. And what areas should be prioritized for housing? You know, we wanna figure out new incentives to get infill development built on that already already developed property that's you know those those vacant lots those vacant commercial buildings and honestly it's just it's a harder lift for developers because when you create a bunch of units there's economies of scale so you know you're going to be able to turn a profit on affordable units when you're building 30 40 50 at a time when you're building 6 at a time it's harder and so we're going to have to think creatively as towns and as communities about how we can incentivize developers to go and do some of that infill because that's what's going to keep our community characters it's going to make our activity centers nice but it's 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 going to be a challenge because the numbers aren't there right under current zoning and under current financial incentives so that's one of the things we're looking at and um, as jay mentioned there's been a lot of progress on adu bylaws i'm interested to see what might come from state legislation on bylaws, because what we've found in talking with the towns is that um, it's there's still many obstacles for even even if a town has passed a bylaw, it's hard for a homeowner to know how to get started, to find a contractor, to find the right financing and, and all of that. And so we're really trying to dig into what, what other incentives we could do. We've seen this happen before with solar panels. Remember when almost nobody had solar panels on their home, but eventually, the right combination of incentives and financing came into place and now many people have solar panels on their home. So we're hoping to see if we can't find some combination of levers that will do that for ADUs. Um, I saw in the chat some people asking about second homeowners and, um, and that kind of thing. We've seen the Cape Cod Commission did a survey of second homeowners and new homeowners, people who recently bought on the Cape and asked them if they were interested in building an accessory dwelling unit. And you know it adds up to you know over a thousand accessory dwelling units. Like it's it's some units. So and again, this is a way to distribute our development a little bit. So we're not moving away from the big affordable housing developments because we need we need to build those, but also we need to consider some of these these other levers too, where we can fill in um, in order to get the number of houses that we need because we need a lot and we need them fast. Thank you, Shana. Okay. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I'm struck by, as you're speaking, how there's this, this need for every tool that we can have in our toolkit. We need them all, and you guys are working on so many of them, um, but also the urgency of this moment that, you know, it, it wasn't good before, it's not going to be better, 
um, simply because we're, we're suddenly moving through past the pandemic. So thank you for all the work you've been doing. Um, and lastly, we're gonna go to Ann Kuspa from Housing Nantucket. Ann, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Dana. And um, thanks to everybody at CHAPA for giving us this opportunity to connect with each other and, and learn from the communities that are in our region. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, let's see, so who are we? Who is Housing Nantucket? Housing Nantucket, we're a nonprofit. We serve the um, Nantucket Island exclusively. So it's a much smaller service area than I think the other people that have spoke certainly. Um, but it doesn't mean that our challenges aren't, we've got challenges, but they are kind of, you know, they're similar, but they're exacerbated here for sure. Um, our, just kind of a snapshot of what our community looks like. Um, we, our census reports about 11,000 people that live in Nantucket County, um, but it's generally accepted that that's a lot lower than what actually live here mostly due to the large population of undocumented workers that we have. Uh, the population steadily growing, but we're seeing the number of year round households going down, which for us means that more households are living in less units. So it's overcrowded situations that um, are really putting people at risk um, for a variety of reasons. But the wealth gap out here, as you can imagine, is pretty extreme. And uh, the inequities that we see in that wealth gap are also very obvious. The types of jobs that lower income people are, are doing, they're just not able to support the high rents and certainly the um, high costs of homes here. Uh, the four-person median family income right now is about one hundred twenty-two thousand eight hundred, and the median home price is two point five million dollars. So, not going to happen in this lifetime unless there are affordable housing solutions that are out there. So that's what we try to do. We have programs that are around affordable rentals, so we create and support and monitor those for other nonprofits. We also have uh, affordable home ownership program, specifically the covenant program, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then we also do a first time home buyer ed, um, which we continue to do on Zoom through the pandemic, which was really cool. So this year at Housing Nantucket, um, our big thing was, um, I mean, mostly maintaining uh, the housing for our tenants. So helping people to pay their rent. A big issue, as I know it was across the state, was affordable childcare. So, you know, just not people not able to work either because they were sick or because their um, own job wasn't wasn't available to them. So it made it difficult here. But as I heard others say as well, um, our community foundation specifically really went out there and raised a lot of money for rental assistance programs to keep people in their homes. So that was really, really amazing. Um, we created eight covenant homes this year. What we were seeing, like the covenant program allows, it's a zoning allowance. So it's a bonus for homeowners. They can subdivide a parcel that ordinarily they couldn't as long as they put an affordability covenant on it. So these units, there's, we're at 99 at this point. So it's a significant amount of, of units that are scattered around. So they're all scattered in different sites and they don't cost anything for our organization or the town to create because it's like a bonus for the property owner. They can subdivide their parcel when ordinarily they couldn't. So that's where the incentive has come. And what we see is it helps actually year round households to stay on the island by taking advantage of this provision, being able to sell a portion of their land that they ordinarily couldn't. So then they're able to stay on the island. So that's been pretty cool. Um, a lot of land has been done this year as opposed to homes, secondary dwellings. And we're seeing modular builds because the cost of uh, building is so high too. So let's see, so other stuff, 
big deals for us. We um, have been, as a community, really cognizant of the partnerships that exist, especially between the affordable housing entities. Uh, the town's affordable housing trust has been really amazing. Um, and their funding stems from our town meeting voters. So there's been, because people are really at the issue is certainly glaring. So people wanna do stuff about it. And when we propose these funding initiatives at town meeting, they are really just gliding on through. So, which is great. It's one-time expenditures though. So one year expenditures where as opposed to what we really need and what we've been trying for year, years is this reliable funding source like our local home petition, uh, home rule petition, which is that the housing bank transfer fee that we've been trying for years to get passed, but it's kind of like hung up in the state legislation. Um, so we're still continuing to pursue that. Um, and that would be very good for us because then that would get that dedicated, reliable funding stream that we need to build the housing to, um, to you know, for generations to come. So it's not just these short-term solutions. We, Housing Nantucket is really excited because this year we um, went in with the town and through a grant purchased a two acre parcel and now are uh, developing plans to create 22 new affordable rental units at that site, which is very large for us. Um, it serves its rentals. So um, the income brackets that will be served there are between pretty much 50% AMI up through 150% AMI, one, two, and three bedrooms. We've made great progress as a community within the past three years on our subsidized housing inventory list. So that's been a group effort and certainly the town deserves a lot of applause, which I will give them myself for really, yeah, um, it's been a big deal. We've maintained uh, our safe harbor for several years, which, you know, we understand that because we've been so deficient in our 10%, yes, we need to be putting all hands on deck to create this housing, but we, uh, we don't really want to be in that position where we're kind of on our back feet, defending ourselves against the unfriendly 40 Bs. So this problem has been acknowledged. And now we're kind of biding our time while we get this longer term plan and solutions implemented so that we can meet that 10%. Um, within the past three years, we went from about 2% to now we're at five and a half percent. So Big deal, big deal, and we're super excited about that. So um, that's kind of the long and short of it. I mean, issues that we have, still trying to get solar panels, like a wide spread solar initiative to help, especially low income tenants to have access to renewable power. Um, that it's not that easy, especially for us as a nonprofit, because we can't we don't have access to the um, federal and state tax incentives that a homeowner would. So trying to bring that here, as well as our low-income homeownership unit owners, you know, they don't always have the cash outlay to put out for, you know, the upfront cost to get those panels on their homes as well. So that's been a push for these next, uh, we'll be doing that for probably about the next year. So I hope next year when I present to you, then we'll be able to talk about success in that department. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. It's really a pleasure to hear about all the progress you're making. Going from two to 5% is, is actually very much something to be um, applauded. So thank you for, for all that work and everything else you've been doing. Um, just to David uh, from the Dukes County Regional Housing Authority offered to give a very quick vineyard update. Um, to round out and make sure all of our communities are covered. So we're going to go to David. And then I do see a lot of conversation happening in the chat and we will come to that and all of your comments in just a minute. So David, please. Uh, thank you, Dana. And um, anybody who knows me knows I lied to you when I said it would be quick, but I'll try. Um, we, uh, as you might know, the, the Regional Housing Authority represents six towns. Uh, we've been talking with our good friends on Nantucket, where I worked for a dozen years, and I can say I'm totally envious 
of um, their process going to one town and their support is very direct. Um, that said, uh, we have very, very good uh, support from town voters. When you put a proposal up uh, and you make a good case, it gets the funding. As much uh, interference as you might run into with various boards of selectmen and such, and they can be very, very supportive as well, but uh, the voters are unequivocal in their support, and that's huge. Uh, we currently manage 101 rental units across five towns. Uh, there are up to 180 units in development. To the earlier point, we had an 11-year process of an RFP, uh, which thankfully was put out a couple of weeks ago and uh, was, um, uh, you know, is uh, 34 units. And, um, and that's in the town of Edgartown, the town of Oak Plus, uh, much more quickly uh, managed uh, an RFP uh, for between 50 and 75 units overall over a few phases. Um, Island Housing Trust, and Philippe can speak to that, is currently in the process of building 20 units uh, of rental housing in uh, the town of Tisbury. So there is growth right now. Uh, unfortunately, the, the trickle of housing opportunities that uh, we had gotten to was uh, completely shut off during COVID. Not, not unusual for many of the communities. Uh, but out here, we had two to 3,000 uh, seasonal homeowners moving into their, uh, uh, their summer homes uh, year round. Uh, we had uh, over 500 property sales. Um, and on this small an island, that, that the ripples from that just completely shut down. Uh, the uh, possibilities of folks doing the seasonal shuffle, moving into summer rentals uh, and uh, to get through to where they can get a decent rental back in September or October. That, that was pretty much over uh, at this point. Um, one of the, uh, uh, a couple of really important things for us, Housing Assistance Corp access through their portal uh, uh, just moved the dial hugely for raft monies. And we're very appreciative of that because, you know, we have a situation out here without the uh, caseworker, uh, you know, directly working with households that the housing authority might not see. Our numbers look pretty low. The fact is, uh, they're not. They're representative uh, of the um, working folks out here that need that support. Uh, and um, uh, so needless to say, uh, this year, uh, RAFT really came through in a big way. Our administrator, um, uh, Barbara Hoffman, worked really closely with great RAFT people. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, we won various town programs, um, which are interesting, uh, ownership and monitoring and, and various uh, other things, a uh, demo uh, delay ordinance modeled on Nantuckets from uh, all those years ago. And, uh, but uh, the housing bank effort is just huge for us. And, you know, I was around for um, the first effort where we thought we had it you know, 15 years ago, and then a little bit of uh, state realtor advocacy clicked in at the last moment and we lost it. Uh, and uh, so I'm very happy. Uh, the coalition to form the housing bank effort is really doing a bang them up job of building uh, consensus and uh, support uh, as they work on the particulars. And, uh, you know, in this effort statewide gains steam when uh, Boston and other municipalities joined it. So I think uh, we're hopeful and that will be really significant uh, for us in the coming years. Uh, right now we take no solace in telling uh, good people there are wait lists you get on, but that's pretty much it right out here. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, David. And I appreciate you stepping in and, and sharing uh, your updates. Um, echoing a lot of what your colleagues and the other communities um, speak of, but also your unique perspective on the vineyard. Um, so I want to go to the chat and also open it up to questions. There's been a lot of chatter uh, in the chat about transfer fees and in your conversations. 
Um, Abi from Chapa is gonna, I think, give some context on that. And I also know that Jay um, from CDP wanted to speak on that as well. So uh, I, I would like to first of all say and just echo what Dana said earlier that it's going to take a lot of different tools and policies to really address the housing shortage and uh, the increased housing prices that we are seeing, especially across Cape. Uh, and I want to just reiterate that housing choice is one of the tools. We need a lot more and that's what we are trying to work on. Uh, CHAPA does support the HERO bill, which again is a tool to, uh, which again is a proposal to increase uh, revenue for that is available for affordable housing. Uh, in terms of real estate transfer fees, CHAPA is supportive of the overall concept of uh, having statewide real estate transfer fees, but we are yet to wet a specific proposal or language that we can say that we are behind, um, but we do support the concept overall. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, uh, break it down that CHAPA has a very, very intense process of how we come upon to uh, supporting uh, or listing a priority on our um, advocacy agenda. <clears throat> so uh, it just takes us a little bit more time to wet it and wet the specific language. And that is what we are doing with the real estate uh, proposals. But we are definitely uh, in support of having a real estate transfer fee across the state because we know that uh, in order to make affordable housing developments work, as uh, Shauna mentioned, it does require a lot of uh, revenue and subsidies, uh, which we are trying to work on. Uh, just to mention again, housing bond bill was another thing that we supported and we will be supporting as in when it comes up to, uh, you know, make sure that we have all the revenue. I also want to touch upon the federal revenue that is coming in and uh, those are the discussions we are having to see how we can leverage that for meeting all of these uh, demands that we have. And so uh, I, I would welcome all these suggestions and I would really encourage if you can join our committees and bring up all of these uh, inputs to those committees where we have we sort of hash out all of these specific recommendations and policies uh, and language for um, some of our bills um, so i would say that please do get engaged we want to hear and this is exactly the kind of input we want to hear from you guys so thank you and uh, yes we we are supportive of a lot of those concepts thank you Abby. and jay you know, I think as you all just heard that the transfer tax is certainly one of many options, but I wanted to just share um, uh, a conversation that I had with our state representative um, on the outer and lower Cape, uh, Sarah Peake, who is the uh, second assistant to majority leader in the House and part of leadership. Um, and, you know, her feeling is that, um, unfortunately, the transfer tax amendment took a very negative vote last year in the budget round. And so they're currently, the House is on record of, uh, for uh, uh, defeating that, amend that, that transfer tax language by a significant margin. And so that is something I think we should absolutely continue to press for. But our number one priority right now in terms of funding here on the Cape and Islands should be to be grabbing the Airbnb tax money. Um, uh, every one of our lower Cape towns, with the exception of uh, Orleans, which is going to use those funds uh, to build out its sewer system, which is really important to developing more affordable housing. But every one of those uh, of our towns is still has yet to commit uh, how to use that money. And we're talking millions of dollars. Uh, we're also talking about a revenue stream where our towns have the potential to go out and borrow tens of millions of dollars for housing production. And um, uh, Rep Peek you know, shared with me that um, it's really gonna be hard for her to advance a real estate transfer tax when we're getting tons of money on the Cape and Islands that most communities in the Commonwealth are not getting. And if we're not using the resources that we already have in hand, it's really hard for her to make the argument that Beacon Hill should pass another tax uh, to give us more revenue. So I really encourage us all to make uh, you know, grabbing the, the Airbnb tax should be our number one policy priority on the municipal uh, uh, level. Shauna, yeah. did you want to speak to that? As yeah, well? I just wanted to jump in on that to say this is the same that just to sort of uh, reiterate that it's just difficult to ask for more money when the towns aren't showing that they're using the money they have available for affordable housing. So again, if we can you know, our thought is it might be something that we revisit, you know, later, but first we have to make 
we have to make progress. If we have, I mean, again, there's towns that have identified land for affordable housing and RFPs have not been issued, you know, so that doesn't make the argument that the real obstacle here is that they're not getting this influx of new money, right? And and there are there there is this other money on the table that needs to get spoken for before it gets just absorbed into general operating budgets year after year. It's meant to it's meant to address the housing and wastewater crisis. And I would just add that uh, this is exactly where Chapa is at because we are so focused on trying to figure out all these other streams and making sure that we get our recommendations that work for um, you know all the communities that we have not been able to focus on some of the other things. And so I would definitely second that. Uh, only point I want to add is this is where uh, local coalitions are also they play a huge and critical role because if local coalitions are able to demand you know municipalities do use that money and how they use that money that can also really help uh, create that revenue and make sure they use that for affordable housing so I, I would definitely plug in the work that MEI is doing and uh, just the importance of local coalitions. One other theme I'm seeing in the chat, um, and, and there has been some answers back and forth, um, is on second and third vacation homes. And Shauna, you spoke to that in, in your response, um, but just wanted to raise that, see if folks have any additional things to say on that. There were a couple of suggestions, some uh, looking to Vancouver for some, some guidance. Um, other thoughts on that from the group, Philippe? Um, not on that in particular, but I would just like to say that um, the vineyard's experience with the real estate transfer tax has been huge. We have conserved more land on this island because of a public entity, the land bank, that has nothing to do with the towns, frankly. I mean, they're represented, but this is a, an, this is a state uh, enabled agency that protects land and is collecting over 12 to $20 million a year. Um, now that we've hit a billion dollar, uh, you know, in revenues from um, sales revenues from, from real estate, they're in, in, a, in a unique position and they've done a lot of amazing work. So if you look at states like Vermont that have done the same thing, but are doing it both for um, open space and for affordable housing, um, it's correct that we just don't have here in the state. So, I mean, the reality is these um, other pots of money are great but they're not enough. And our region is a revenue engine for this state. And we need to have the help because disparities are huge. We don't have the census tracts that a lot of other places have. So we need to have that recognition that as a region, um, we are going to lose our communities. We're gonna lose our workforce and we need to have all kinds of uh, considerations, including the real estate transfer tax. But I would also say something akin to um, gateway communities in terms of how we can access state funding. Um, frankly, we're looking right now because the costs are, are tremendous and seeing where we can find more subsidies. So if any of you know more money that's available, please send them my way, Jay, because we are having a really hard time coming up with subsidies we need to keep the AMIs um, you know, below 80% at this point. Um, so I, I think we have to do more, and I think the state needs to recognize that we are, uh, as a region, providing a lot of revenue for the state, and, and we need the support. Um, and I think what we're saying here is, you know, the Airbnb funds are great, but they're not enough. A real estate transfer tax, is, tax would be significant, and we need to have that level of revenue in order to make a difference. Thank you. And Alan, I see your hand raised. Yes, I, I just wanted to jump in because uh, I, I was sort of the guy who grabbed all the short-term rental tax to pay for a wastewater system in Orleans. Um, and it's worked. Uh, the combination of that and the Cape and Islands is gonna pay for 75% of a $60 million plant. Now, the other thing that doesn't hit the newspapers is because we have put in that wastewater system, we have the opportunity for over a thousand new dwelling units in the Seward area that could not have been built without the sewer system. So uh, take 10% of those for, for the fun of it and you got a, another 100 units. 
that, that come that way. Now, the other thing that I think people need to understand, and I've focused on finance here, you know, the Orleans Affordable Housing Committee, at the same time we decided to dedicate money for this wastewater system, went to the town meeting and said, would you please appropriate 1% of the annual budget in the town of Orleans through a general override for affordable housing. It passed nearly unanimously. So that was an ask of the voters to put up money on an annual basis for affordable housing. I think we probably made a mistake. We should have asked for 2% and did some other things. But nevertheless, when the voters are asked for hot issues and we have collectively created affordable housing as a hot issue, they come to the table. The last thing that I wanna mention is uh, we are uh, at the end of 20 years of land bank. We switched to community preservation. My, and I've been involved from the beginning. We have always thought about community preservation budgets on an annual basis. How much money do we have in the pool in cash for that year and how do we spend it? Orleans this year became the first town since Bedford is the only other town that's done it said, all right, let's buy an affordable housing restriction from the Penrose Cape Cod 5 project for $2 million. That is going to cost us a little over $100,000 a year. So take a look at your annual CPC budget and figure out ways you can use that money for bonding housing. And it can become a commitment. In our case, $110,000 a year is uh, less than the 10% we have to spend. And by the way, it's only about 30% of the state reimbursement. So the sales pitch is we're getting this uh, Penrose project at effectively no cost to the taxpayers of Orleans. Hmm. So I would urge people to look carefully at your CPA programs. They all inherited debt from the land bank most of that debt has been paid down. So there is an incredible amount of leverage available in CPA. In our case, we've probably got about 13 to $15 million of bonding capacity that is not being used. And let's use it for affordable housing if we can. And just in closing, to follow up on some comments that have been made, I think we need to think very carefully about how we can generate funding assistance from the state level, particularly on projects that are smaller. You know, the, the sweet spot now is 50 to 60 units, state investment tax credits, federal investment tax credits, the developer is gonna to have to finance 20% of the deal, you know, all, all the things that we know about. But I think on Cape Cod, we're going to run into a land use problem. We are not going to be able to create 50 and 60 unit projects off into the future to solve this problem. And we're going to have to figure out a way to create some funding sources that are real for the smaller projects. And we've got one now that, that Hack knows about, um, <laughs> uh, which we'll be talking about in the next week or two, 14 units. You know, town of Orleans is going to be into that project at probably 55 to 60 percent of the total project cost, our money. You know, yeah, it's helped from somewhere, but the voters may begin to say, wait a minute, why are we spending, in this case, $400,000 per unit? Well, mm -hmm. you know why, because the cost of construction has gone up. God, I bought three pieces of sandpaper last week at the hardware store and it cost me $6. So lumber is the same problem. So we, we've got to figure out ways to use perhaps some of this billion dollars of federal money that the governor wants to move towards housing to focus on some of the smaller projects that can then be integrated into the neighborhoods. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And I think we have time for just one more comment. Um, Keep your comments coming in the chat because we will be saving those and, and checking in on them. But Brooke, you have your hand raised um, before we have to close out. Yeah, hi, um, I'm with the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust and I just wanna reiterate the importance of continuing to work toward the housing transfer fee. Um, the numbers just, I mean, Nantucket's an extreme example, but the numbers in terms of cost and subsidy so far outstrip whatever we're gonna get through the short-term rental tax. And um, it's a little demoralizing to hear 
mediocre or lukewarm support um, on that or confusion or accepting the pushback from the state house. I, I'm just not ready to accept that pushback. And I think that um, there are a lot more voices and we hope that yours will join us to continue to work toward that because it's, it's critical for us on Nantucket, absolutely critical. And the reality is short-term rentals have more impact than affordable housing on waste, on water quality, wastewater, and that tax also needs to be used for those other things. And so um, for us, this long-term funding stream is critical, really critical to solving the problem. So I just wanna make that point, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone. This has been, I think maybe our most active conversation discussion. Um, so I really appreciate all of you sticking with us and being a part of the conversation. Uh, like I said, we are saving the chat. We are saving your comments and this will weigh into how we do our work going forward. So just a couple of things as we leave you, um, just a reminder that the, the recording will be available on our website. We uh, encourage you to take a look at our website and encourage and register for our upcoming events. We just announced our, our annual dinner um, awardees. I'm really excited about the, the folks we'll be honoring there. And uh, again, to reiterate both uh, B and Ryan and Whitney, encouraging you to join our committees and, and show up to those meetings. That's where we continue to have these conversations. Having all of your voices in the room for those would be, would be really helpful. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in doing anything more around municipal engagement, please do reach out to me or Whitney or Lily. Um, and thank you so much all for being here today.